Hello, this is David D. Hilser. I am a critical thinker, dissident scientist, and if you're not buying exactly what mainstream physics and cosmology are selling, then this is the place for you. There are thousands and thousands of scientists around the world that have been working outside the mainstream and have identified problems, fixed those problems, and are proposing new theories and models. You won't find anything like this on the YouTube or the internet, so be sure to click on click below on subscribe and the little bell next to it so you will be alerted when the next video drops. I am going to talk about and review and give you actually just a particular perspective on a book that every critical thinker must read. And what is that book? Dinosaurs and the Expanding Earth. The third edition, Solving the Mystery of the Dinosaur's Gigantic Size by Stephen Hurl. Who is he? Stephen Hurl is a mechanical engineering person who has design, who had various design positions in companies in the UK, which brought him to a very interesting conclusion about dinosaurs. It was his role as a mechanical design engineer at the UK's Electricity Research Center that first offered him his insight into how scale effects were pertinent to the biomechanical problems of the dinosaur's large size. These thoughts about dinosaurs as engineering structures and problems of, of scale F effects fostered the development of the reduced gravity theory and its implications for the expanding Earth. Wow, reduced gravity theory means what? That the Earth was smaller, but its gravitational field was smaller, meaning it had less mass. Oh my gosh, that's an apple cart. You're gonna, as uh, Neil Adams says, that you that you don't want to overturn it in mainstream science. But let's take a look at it. And one of the things I really like about books, a lot of books, if they're uh, got a great introduction, is to tell us how this came about. Why did this person even do this? Normally. These people do not go out and set out to say, well, I'm going to come up with an idea that gravity was less uh, a long time ago, millions of years ago, and that's not how it happened. So let's read a little bit of the story of how this happened. In October 1987, while on a lazy beach holiday in Portugal with my wife and son, this is Steve talking, I pondered the question of the di dinosaur's gigantic size compared with present day life. As a design engineer, I was particularly interested in calculations which showed the bones of the larger dinosaurs were too weak to support their own body weight. Here was the essential paradox of the dinosaur's large size. Their bones should buckle and crack under today's gravitational field or gravitational force. There is one simple yet astonishing answer. Today's life has evolved to live in our present gravity. In reduced gravity, dinosaurs would weigh less, so bones, ligaments, and muscles could be weaker. Blood pressure would also be less. Effectively, the scale of life is controlled by gravity. So a weaker gravity would allow all life to become larger. Dinosaurs could become, uh, could become huge if the ancient Earth's surface gravity was weaker than the present gravity. Huge implications, of course. All these doubts were rapidly overturned when I, Stephen, returned home and researched the local library. There, were no, there was no internet in those days. It was soon obvious that several geologists had already proposed such a smaller di diameter ancient earth based on geological, geological evidence that the earth had expanded to its present size, an expanding earth. Could it be true? Could it, could it be so simple? And what happens is, because he's a mechanical engineer and a designer, he actually, I talked with him several times, and what he told me, uh, I, I hope to get him, I am going to get an interview with him. Give me time, people. Setting up interviews long distance with these people is tough, getting our schedules together, but I hope to have him on. But he, we did talk already before, uh, I think via Skype, and he basically said, I asked him, hey, wh what happened? He said, well, I found out when I had a piece that he was asked to uh, increase the size of. So it was something like um, this, okay? This is a battery, uh, one of those batteries you put for your phones. He says uh, he was asked to mechanically increase the size, to double and triple the size. And he was confounded that when you do that, it's not just twice as much. It's not just three times as much. It's much more than that. In fact, it is not a linear scale. And if you look at this little diagram from his book, it tells the entire story. And this is why he was got on this path. 
you say take a look at here you see the one cube and then a cube that is double in size i think pretty much everybody would say yep that's double in size but he asked the question is this large box two four or eight times bigger than the small box or all three although it seems a trivial question understanding the answer explains the mystery of scales and it absolutely does and this let's take a look at it well two times well you can see it's twice as big as what we would say in colloquial terms but four times as big well if you look at the surface of one of those sides you see one side has one on the one cube and it has four on the other so wait a minute that's four times but oh oh the volume is actually four times two which is eight you have eight times so this this economy of scale isn't simply a linear thing so that oh, if you're gonna get it twice as big just make the bones bigger and everything will work fine well He's a material, uh, he's a uh, mechanical engineer, and materials tell you a lot about how the, what kind of stresses they can uh, hold in today's gravity. So let's keep going further. So let's take a look at another diagram he has in the book. It's very telling. All of these bridges are made of the same material. Let's say they're made out of um, some type of plastic that can bend or whatever. That way, uh, you know, concrete, of course, uh, would have a hard time bending like this. But let's say it's a really tough plastic. Now, if you look at the, the um, they're all the same. They're exactly the same. The only difference is the scale. So the first one underneath looks totally fine. The second one you see starts to buckle under its weight. The third is even worse. And this is the problem. Herein lies the problem. You can't simply scale everything up. That is, well, the guys, the dinosaurs have bigger bones. Well, that's what he's saying. It doesn't work that way. And this, I love this diagram, and I even love more the next diagram. And that is the way we really build bridges under scale. When we first started building bridges, they were stone. And that first one at the very bottom, you've got to go from the bottom, uh, you can see right here, from the bottom to the next to the top. Well, the first one would be made of stone. And that looks fine. But the moment you get to the next one, if you made it out of stone, you'd have a problem where the thing would be so heavy, it couldn't support its own weight. So what do they do? Well, they put holes in it. Maybe it's like concrete. So when the concrete was used. And then if you want to even get bigger, you take a look at, oh, you've got to do this all backwards. Take a look at this top one. It's made out of trusses. Why do they all do this? Because you can't simply scale everything up. You can't take something made out of stone and scale it up because things don't work. And that's what happens. But it doesn't only happen with building materials for bridges. It also, he took this idea of the cube, remember, and start looking at animals. So if you look at this, you have basically a small and a large animal in the same gravity. Consider two animals of exactly this, the same shape. One animal twice as large as the other, both in the same gravity. The gravity, the larger animal would have double the leg stress due to the effect of scale. The scale effect sets a boundary to the upper scale of life. So you have, in this case, the length is one. You can see the length is two. The area is one. The area then goes to four. The mass is one. The mass goes to eight. And what makes things heavy? What does gravity act upon? Mass. So the stress levels on things becomes great, much more great than just two times. And what, what, uh, Steve, uh, Mr. Hurl is, Hurl is saying is that in fact you cannot simply scale it and say oh they're bigger so they have bigger bones and it all work fine so when we see Jurassic Park and we see those giant animals f going and freely moving and we just look in awe and those giant brown sources go way up they'd be big blobs laying on the ground dying and die pr probably pretty quickly in today's gravity but no one talks about that. Hey, Mr. Spielberg, you weren't a critical thinker. You just took everything and you said, oh, these are cool. What it would be like? Well, guess what? You'd have to put them on a smaller planet. We would be bounding around in half the weight and we could jump farther and hit golf balls. Boy, the, think of how, how far you, Tiger Woods, how big those, you'd have to make those golf courses huge. So what he's saying is there is a limit that gravity puts on animals. And for uh, uh, dinosaurs to live today, what happens? Well, this is a problem, and this was recognized by Galileo. 
Galileo's scale effect. Galileo illustrated the problem of scaling a man by showing how a man's thigh bone would, would need to be scaled into a giant. You notice it's not just bigger one. It just doesn't, it doesn't look the same. It's humongous. It's gotten it had to get bigger. It's got to had to get thicker. If you take that one and shrink it down, it'll look like a gigantic fatter bone, littler bone. Well, why is that? It's made of material. Material has stresses. Materials can't simply be scaled linearly. That is twice as big, just twice as much. No, but that's not what we see in dinosaurs. We see pretty decent sized bones for the structure if they were in our, in our gravity today, but much smaller. So Galileo noted, if one wishes to maintain a great giant, the same proportion uh, of limb as found in ordinary man, he, he, had, he must admit a diminution, diminution of strength in comparison with men of medium stature. For if his height be increased inordinately, he will fall and be crushed under his own weight. This is Galileo Galilei, 1638. Hey, Spielberg, you didn't even read this? I mean, you can't say that it's not modern times. That's a pretty long time ago. So this has been thought about by many brilliant minds, including Mr. Stur Stephen Hurl. So let's take a look at this. It's a little smaller, but I can read it for you if you have a bigger screen. Um, same thing goes there, but he says, calculating the forces of geometry, similar animals in different gravity define relationship between life scale and gravity. An animal's leg stress is due to the force of gravity. If gravity is halved, then the large animal can double its linear size, but its leg stress will be the same as in the small animal's stressed leg. So what he's saying is, that the proportions we see, which much more look like more proportions of what we see today, and they couldn't be, we know by stress if it was in the same gravity, show to us what? Gravity had to be less in the ancient times, millions and millions of years ago. That's not a good, good thing though, right? That means the earth had less mass. Where's it coming from? Well, that's Earth exp expanding. That's expansion tectonics. We have lots to talk about. I'm not going to answer that because you can get that answer in his book. So that is very interesting about that. So he even comes up with the equation for a particular form of life, the linear scale of land-based life is inversely proportional to the strength of the gravitational field, and he gives you this equation, where SR is the scale of the life, the land-based life relative to today's land-based life. Uh, and GR, the gravity relative to today is gravity. So what do, you, what do you think he's going to do with this equation? Graph it! And there we go. So if you look at, and actually, he was just looking at the sizes by, through the fossil record. This is what you come up with. This is a reduction of, the, of size over the millions of years. And what do you have? You have getting smaller and smaller. The largest land animals, we're talking about land animals, because in water you can float around, you can be huge in the water. Land animals have gotten smaller in a very precise little graph. So if you take this even a step further and say, well, the reason that's happening is gravity, you get this. Gravity increase over geological time. An increasing surface gravity on Earth is indicated by reducing scale of life over hundreds of millions of years. So here's a mechanical engineer, basically, who thought to himself, well, wait a minute, all those things I see in Jurassic Park and all those movies, those things as a mechanical engineer, will they actually, he didn't even come that way. He actually was told to make something bigger. He said, hey, make this three times bigger. And he started discovering that, hey, this isn't a linear process. And this is what he came up with. He, had, he then looked around, hey, is any geologist saying this? Hey, lots of them are. Lots of them in the sense of more than one. And what, did he, what does he do? He comes to all this conclusion and graphs this. And believe it or not, he has actually taken these, this data. And he's talked with people like Dr. James Maxlow, who happens to be the world-renowned, eminent geologist, bar none, on expansion tectonics. And they pretty much agree on what they've found, both with the uh, gravity changing, the size of the Earth, all of that seemed to match up just from mechanical 
analysis of materials for living things on land. This is amazing. This is something that everybody should read. Every critical thinker who loves science should read this book, period. You should read it. I am, I'm leaving out all kinds of things, and I will tell you uh, at the end, one of the things he put in that the why the geologists say there's mass increase. I will tell you what it is, but you'll have to read about why. And of course, here's the last one I will show you, which is uh, the size of animals, which he sort of just drew uh, 150 million years ago, 40 million years ago, and present day. And those are the biggest land animals. You notice something going on? They're smaller. So yes, all those Jurassic Park things are really great, but T-Rex wouldn't be running around the way he, he, would, he is in the movies in today's gravity. So what does he conclude? And I always like to give the author their conclusion, so I will make, uh, make that uh, uh, for them. And again, I will tell you, stay, stay tuned here. The diver this diverse range of evidence points to, the, points to the conclusion that the Earth is still in the midst of creation. Creation meaning gaining mass. The Earth's surface gravity is slowly increasing because the Earth's mass is increasing, and the, this increasing gravity has reduced the scale of life over millions of years. The continents are separating because the Earth is expanding as new mass is added to it. If we look around, or we can look around us with clear, with a clear mind, stripped of dogma of the past, we can clear, we can very clearly see these processes happening. Which he says he's a critical thinker. You have to always come at every piece of new knowledge as this could be possible. Not this, not in the, I'm going to defend this till the end. I know it's wrong. Let me tell you why. That's what mainstream does. When they hear all of this, that's what they go. When they're reading this and they're watching you, if you're a person that, that's mainstream, your whole mind is, how can you argue against this? You don't take into account what the arguments are. You have to be open-minded to everything, including mainstream data as it could, could be wrong and new data that it could be right. And what is the, the thing in the book that I found most intriguing and, and mass increases? How do geologists tell that any evidence that the Earth really has been gaining mass? The little Easter egg I will give you is the height of dunes, of sand dunes. I will not tell you any more about that because I want Stephen Hurl's work to be read by you guys, by you critical thinkers, and it will definitely ch change your whole perspective. And when you watch those dinosaur movies, you in your mind, you can think of them flopping around. Fact, I've got an idea, and that idea is to someday go to these people who make the graphics, turn, graphi turn the graphics to half the gravity, because they put in the gravity, and see what it would really look like. That would be fascinating. Will they do it? Probably not, because why? All the Hollywood people want to pretend that they're smart and they, they rub elbows with like the, the big uh, theoretical physicists and cosmologists and astrophysicists of the day. And they'll just go, oh, 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 this is so funny. This, of course, is wrong. Doesn't matter. This is right, folks. Critical, critical thinking can only lead you to the conclusion that Stephen Hurl is. Yes, like I said, don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. Anybody else is on faith. Stay critical. Stay thinking. I am David DeHilser, your science therapist. And this is a book a must read. Seven bucks. Come on. It'll blow your mind. Ciao for now.